some of these questions that I'm going to put to you have been asked ten times over in other letters in other ways. Um, and a very popular question was, uh, is your real name James Ewer? Is this true? Can you answer this? This is an actual fact. Quite true. Male and, name. And, and the name Midge is Jim's backwards. Is that how you got the, the nickname? Well, it is, but I don't think that's why I got it. I think it was something to do with my height. When I joined uh, the band who later became Slick, um, I was christened that. I was only 17 or 18 at the time, so uh, I, I couldn't argue against it. Everyone else was bigger than me. They would <laughs> beat me up, you know. <laughs> that's another call. I was going to come to this a little bit later because there's quite a few letters from people who want to know your exact... Why? Maybe you've got some Christmas presents coming, but they want to know your exact height, and uh, somebody wants to know if you stand on a box with pictures of the men rest of Ultra Vox. <laughs> <laughs> He's not that short. I mean, how, how high are you? I mean, uh, in the, <laughs> I'm talking about your dimensions. Right, here. okay, right. Uh, I, I think I'm about five foot seven. Five foot seven. No less than that, anyway. Okay. And no, I don't stand in a box. I stand in warm. And that, that makes me about the same height as Billy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. everybody last saw you in a big way on television in the Rock and Pop Awards, and you did that, that funny bit from uh, Sydney when you were walking in front of the bridge, New which Castle. looks very much like the Newcastle yeah. Bridge. <laughs> now, that, that was a pretty major tour. I mean, you were, seen, were away for a very long time. Yeah, we were. That was, that was only part of it as well, the Australian Japan thing. The tour actually started in Britain in September last year. Uh, we'd three weeks off over Christmas and then went off after doing Europe and all that. Uh, we went off and did uh, the Australian and Japan thing. We missed out America because we thought it would kill us, probably. You know? I mean, I know why Joe Strummer's disappeared because he's done the same. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, last week he was talking about his schedule, I mean, around the world, exactly playing these exotic places. I mean, were they as exotic as we might uh, think? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> they were, they're stunning, yeah. I mean, it's just it's quite a place to go to. Australia I was really surprised about because I didn't expect anything. I mean, we keep getting this terrible image of beer-swilling, fat, you know, bozos, you know. And it's nothing like that. Well, I'm sure there's some of them somewhere, but, you know, I didn't see any. It's a fabulous place. It's mm. like, if you can imagine, uh, you know, Scunthorpe setting a tropical paradise, that's what it's like. <laughs> Um, now you were away. No, no, no. I, I'm, I was the one that was away when um, Yellow Pearl was picked up as the the top of the pop theme. Was that a big surprise for you? It certainly was because the the song was uh, it already been released as a single uh, from Philip's solo album, and it didn't really do anything. Uh, and, and then uh, the blue after the record, we thought the record was dead and gone and never see it again. Out the blue, the top of the pops came to us and said they really liked the music and they wanted a special remix. And, and I went into the studio and did it for them. I mean, when you do gigs with Ultravox, do you stick to Ultravox tracks, or do you do things like Yellow Pearl that people may want to see you perform, things that they know you of? No, no. Uh, when I, Ultravox is, is my main thing, obviously. And when I work with Ultravox, I do nothing but Ultravox. I see. Um, you brought something solo in, which is a, a scoop, which we're going to play a little bit later. Mm, certainly is. All right, we'll come to that in a second. Jane Hall um, wants to know how you felt when you were asked to fill in for Gary Moore on Thin Lizzy's U.S. tour. Yeah, how did that happen? Uh, well, I'd, I'd already known Philip uh, for a year or so, just a mutual liking. And uh, I'd done a bit of work with him at his, his home, co-written a song for one of the albums. Uh, and through that, he knew that I could, I could actually play guitar fairly well. And when Gary Moore left in the American tour, I got a call from Philip. He was in Arkansas or somewhere. And I got a call at home, this bizarre phone call saying, you know, can you jump in Concord tomorrow and come out and stand in? And I'd never been to America, I'd never been outside, you know, Britain, really, you know. And did you know Thin Lizzy songs? No, I, I knew all of them, and I, I yeah. didn't know uh, how to play them or anything, so uh, I stuck all the songs on a cassette, he gave me a list of the songs they were playing, stuck all the songs on a cassette, and I sat in Concord with the headphones on, so, you know, sipping uh, Dom Perignon, you know, it was fabulous, <laughs> it was like, it was like, you know, Judy Garland waiting in the wings while, it, while it, the leading lady breaks her leg and she takes over, you know, and it was like going to America for the first time and learning these songs. I got there that night and was on stage playing with them for 45 minutes. Tremendous. I want to go back. I mean, we don't want to go too far back because you have done so much in a very short space of time. But I was in uh, Dumfries in Glasgow a couple of weekends ago, and somebody that was driving me from uh, Glasgow to Dumfries was telling me how active you were and how known you were in Glasgow before you actually made the chart. What were you doing? I mean, how did you actually start? What were you doing in Glasgow to kind of get yourself into the position where you had hits with Slick, firstly? Right. Well, Slick, as I said earlier, the, um, the main band that was in, in Glasgow was a band called Salvation. Um, and that was, that was 70, 71, 72, when I was just a, just a boy. <laughs> and I still had my, my youthful looks. And, and, uh, 
it, it was a funny situation up there. Uh, you could be enormous in, in Scotland and do all the Scotty circuit. But as soon as you came into to England, uh, no one knew you. I mean, we'd never recorded a record or anything. It was just doing clubs and, and dance halls that had built up this reputation. This fellow was telling me that. He said you were a, a well-known name in Glasgow at That's that time. Right. Yeah. That's right, in, in the whole of Scotland. But uh, it was... We found it impossible getting a recording deal up in Glasgow because it was a very different situation from what it is today. Where there's a lot of talent coming from Glasgow and there's a lot of you know, small labels and uh, studios. There was no studios in Glasgow at the time. I'd never been in a studio till I was 21, which is horrific, you know. Terrible. Well, you've so, uh, made up for it by now. Certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you got off the ground with, with Slick by meeting up with uh, Bill Martin and Phil Conkey. That's right. That was, uh, that was a record deal we, we were offered and uh, we took it. Jane wants to know how you enjoyed or how you feel about pastimes uh, with Slick. And she mentions the rich kids as well. There's, there's good and bad about everything I've done. Uh, the good things about Slick, uh, it was the end of an era. It was the end of the teeny bop screaming you know, idolization that was going on at the time. And uh, I mean, I, I, was, I feel quite lucky to, to have been part of that. You know, I mean, nobody gets you know, three, four thousand screaming girls at a concert anymore. And I, I, I remember that. I've been through that. And it's great. Um, but on the other hand, I, I wasn't too happy about the songs we're recording, the situation we ended up in. All, these things always turn sour somewhere. I always like Requiem as one of your songs. Requiem was a real good song. I really liked it. It was when it got to things like the kids are punk. I thought that was awful. You know, I couldn't handle that. If we had time, I was actually going to play a snatch of Requiem tonight, but I can see that we're going to be having a lot to talk about. But w what I will play next is a song that was a record of the week of mine when it first came out, and I still like it as much today as I did then, sounding really sycophantic. But it's the rich kids, um, who followed pretty well hot on the heels of Slick, didn't they? That's right. It was uh, when Slick had finally broken up. I got a phone call from Glenn Matlock, who just left the Pistols um, six months earlier, and he had picked up Steve New and Rusty Egan and was wanting to form the band The Rich Kids. Now, why that was always interesting to me that he would have phoned you because your image was very much as a teeny bop person. I mean, why you know somebody as rough as a former Sex Pistol would, would call on you, for example? Well, it's it's all down to images. I mean, like people seeing me for what I was at the time. I mean, I just looked like you know a, a Bay City Roller or something that that could be shoved away in a corner. You know, an instant hit and then gone. And Glenn was seen as like this hard punk. And yeah. he's not. Glenn's a, a nice guy, and he's got a funny sense of humour as well. So he asked me to join the band, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> the sense of humour. Yeah, right. Bizarre combination. And, and it worked for a bit until uh, the whole thing backfired on us. Why do you think it backfired? Uh, there was too much made of of uh, the fact that the two of us were getting together in, in the one the one band. Too much uh, hype. You there was there was a lot of hype going on around about it, and uh, we just couldn't live up to. It. I mean, we were we were built up to be the biggest thing since the Beatles, which was just ridiculous. Well, the single that you left behind, which I think is one of my top twenty favorites, is "Ghosts of Princes in Towers." Is it one that you can listen to without embarrassment or anything? Uh, yeah, there's some things I can I can listen to. There's a, a, there's certain points you can pick out about it now. Just listen with different ears yeah. um, because it all happened three four years ago. Was this but ever a hit? This song, this no, it wasn't. No, it, it, it got two, a few plays. I mean, as you say, it was yeah. your record of the week, but uh, it just never happened. That's the most of the rich kids stuff. It's odd listening to it even now. I think of it as a hit. Anyway, the rich kids. Mid year is my guest. We'll be back on the other side of this. <laughs> Much of Glenn Matlock these days. Uh, a song not so long ago. A song just before. Before we went off to uh, Australia, it was January or February, I think it was. Um, I know for a fact he's got a band together with uh, Steve, whatever his name is, who used to be the singer in uh, uh, Original Mirrors. Oh, yeah. And they've been out working in Europe, but I uh, haven't heard anything of what they've been doing, but I'm sure it'll be good. What about former members of uh, Slick? Um, Kenny Hislop, I mean, who was a drummer in Slick, uh, was a real close friend of me. Uh, he's just recently left Simple Minds, he's been working with them quite a lot. That's I right. Did, I think it, the last thing he did was the single, Miracle. Yeah. Terrific. I'm, are you uh, always pleased when you see a, a band from Glasgow doing well? Oh, yeah, you know, very much so. I mean, I'm, I'm still I'm Scottish at heart. I mean, I'm, it'll always be there. You know, it's great to see, I mean, altered images and things. It's great. Yeah. Do you go, go to Glasgow very often, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah when, I, when I can. I go back up you know, two or three times a year. Always at Christmas and New Year. Go to. Now, these are very random questions, and they come from anywhere and everywhere. I'll just finish with another question that Jane Hall asked, and that was how you became involved with Visage, and tons more questions. Why have you left Visage? Oh, uh, I became involved with Visage. Well, it's not really an involvement. I mean, we actually started it, Rusty and I, uh, through some solo recordings I'd done after the Rich Kids had broken, broken up. I had some studio time left over from the Rich Kids. And I did a few recordings with uh, Rusty, and he introduced me to Steve. I, I'd, I'd seen that uh, 
the clubs that mm-hmm. started running bullies. Steve Strange. That's right. Yeah. And uh, he he wanted to be a singer, so I brought him in to do some vocal things because not all the things I was doing in the studio particularly wanted to sing. And uh, the ideas just went fast and furious from there. They started flowing as Rusty's ideas tend to. And I stopped him at one of them and said, great, you know, let's get Billy Curry from Ultravox to play and let's get Dave Formula and let's get Barry Adamson and form a, a project, a studio project and uh, just record songs. We all write the songs and all record them and whatever and it would be great. And it was. It was very successful. Had Certainly. A great time. Now, have you left the band? Uh, I'm not involved with them anymore. Um, just disagreements uh, uh, on on how the thing should be going. Um, it's it's just it's one of these things that, that I've I've done a lot of studio work in the last two years, and I find it more interesting doing uh, other things now, not just visage and not just studio work. Uh, uh, I'm into directing videos and things for other people, I know, I which I find I find interesting. Now, I mean, how do you manage to do all this? I mean, you're you're in Bangkok one day and you're making a video with Bananarama the next and you're recording solo stuff. I mean, why? I mean, do you have a general philosophy of life? Maybe you can enlighten and educate everybody. How do you get all this stuff done? I just do it. I mean, there's, I'd, I've, I've had no experience in making videos at all besides uh, being in them, you know, being in the, mm. the early Ultravox ones. Uh, and after I'd seen a couple of the Visage ones, I thought, well, yeah, I can do that. And I just convinced people that I could do it, although I'd never done it before. And, oh, do you ever get turned down? I mean, do we, we obviously don't hear about the times that people say no to an artist who wants to do something, because you seem to have your own way. Everything you want to do, you go ahead and you do, and it's mostly successful. But, uh, I mean, do, have you done a lot of things where people have said, no, I don't really like it? Yeah, I, I, a lot a lot in the beginning. Uh, I've now got a bit of a track record so that I can actually walk in and say to someone, look, uh, I've done this and I've done that, so it, the next step is to do this. Now, if you let me do it, you know. Great, and and I tend to I get my own way sometimes, most of the times, because I can shout a wee bit. I can get a bit uh, <laughs> a bit obnoxious at times. <laughs> <laughs> right, Gene Fielding writes from uh, Lounsley Green, Chesterfield, in Derbyshire, and uh, specifically wants to know uh, what Astrodyne means on the Vienna LP. Astrodyne, it's, it's actually a made-up word as you know as Ultravox, as it's, uh, it doesn't really mean much. And, and I, if you want to get down to the basic, Astra meaning sky, stars. And, uh, dyne meaning a, a, a mode of power, like dynamo, you know. And they're just, they're two powerful sounding words that Warren put together. We actually wanted to call the track, uh, Ad Astra, but, uh, as we, uh, just when we thought the title, we saw loads of things with Ad Astra on it, you know, which is part of the, uh, the REF, mm-hmm. uh, emblem. Alright, Jane also says there was a different style and sound between the Vienna and the Rage in uh, Eden LPs. Are you planning to make your next LP very different from Rage in Eden? The way that Vienna was different from Raging Eden. Yeah, uh, that's that's simply because uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we don't want to stand still and and sort of recreate what we've done in the past. That's why everyone said, "Well, why wasn't there a Vienna on Raging Eden?" And our answer was, "Well, there's a Raging Eden in Raging Eden." And w- Vienna was done, you know, two and a half years ago, or written nearly three years ago. So to us, it was very old, and we recorded in a totally different way with Raging Eden. We spent three months writing an entire album in a studio which we found very hard, very difficult, but we set ourselves a task and we think we pulled it off. Uh, the next album, yeah, we are planning on doing very different again. Uh, we probably won't work with our co-producer, Connie Plank. Oh, this is another question that comes up lots yeah. and lots I was going to put to you. Why, when you're producing other people and all that, have you worked in the past with Connie Plank and why won't you be working with him? Um, well, Connie Plank, uh, you, this, I think it's a bad move producing your own band because a band is made up of however many individuals with strong opinions. And uh, for one person to take control and, and produce an album for them or a, or a record for them, uh, I think the band could easily go off the tracks, um, or, or the other three would fe- feel left out. You know, any one of us could take control and produce an album, but I don't think it would sound like Ultravox. So we like having uh, a referee, as it were, uh, to to say, right, stop. I think what you've done now is great, or, or this is what you should do. You should carry it off in this direction and just guide us a bit. You know. Uh, we don't need much help, but we need someone there just when it gets a bit tense. Mm. So what's going to happen now? Well, we're, we're toying with the ideas of a, a few producers. We haven't made any decisions yet. Um, but whoever it is is going to be uh, exceptional, to say the least, because Connie was very, very good. But we just feel that now is the time to uh, to make a radical change in, in the sound. I mean, just We don't want to record in Germany. And we've, well, Ultravox have done three albums with Connie Plank already. 
and it's too easy to get set in your ways. Okay. Uh, finally, a question that normally comes at the end of chats, but uh, we're not near the end of this chat. Uh, will Ultravox be touring the UK this year, says Gene, or asks Gene Fielding? Certainly will, as long as we can record an album first, you know. Uh, we're talking about getting out on the roads uh, sort of October-ish. Um, so it'll be f before Christmas, but definitely. Good, okay. Back to Midge after this. From our session for Maximum Joy, this is called In the Air. Joy, and that was In the Air. And while that was playing, Midge was saying what a good sound he thought that was. I think uh, you'd uh, do a good job in, the, in our studio session as well. What, you mean actually being, being produced or producing someone else? No, actually <laughs> act actually producing and performing, I think, is producing what we're after. Yes, yeah, an Ultravox session is what we're after, I think, basically. Uh I mean, eight or nine hours, is that enough time to record something? Well, I'm sure we could get a couple of drums in it in that time. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we're, so, we're so unbelievably meticulous, it's ridiculous, you know. I mean, Warren alone can take two days putting a drum track down, you know, to get it exactly the way he wants it. Because he sort of speaks like that, you know, when he wants it just perfect. <laughs> it's, it really, it, it, we're so meticulous, you know. Nine hours, I'm sure we could get something done. What about an, an, an album, then? How long does it take you to record an album? Well, Raging Eden, as I said, took three months, which is quite a long time. But, I mean, don't you, in if you're spending a long time, maybe get bored by a song that you're working on so much? Doesn't it become a little bit tedious? Uh, not not so much uh, in that case. It was quite exciting. The whole idea of doing Raging Eden the way we did it was that we wanted to write most of it in the studio. So we'd go in with a very, very rough idea of what we wanted and construct it. it. I mean, people keep talking about writing songs, but I don't know anybody who actually sits with pen to puts pen to paper and writes dots and all that anymore. I mean, they do it with tape recorders and machines and just remembering riffs and things. And Is that how Vienna came together? Yeah. Yeah, we constructed it. It's all constructed. Nothing was written. The only thing that was written were the lyrics. Now, it's just, now, you revealed a lot of yourself when you did My Top 12 a few a couple of months ago. I remember listening uh, as I was parked while the rest of the family were doing the shopping, and I was listening to this, and I was amazed because I thought it was very courageous of you. You revealed yourself as being uh, a fan of Frank Sinatra's, Caillou Sakamoto and all sorts of things from the from the sixties that were uh, didn't have much of an edge to them, but yet were quite sentimental. And that obviously is something to do with Vienna. I think the tone of, of Vienna. There's a, there's a lot of things that a lot of the things that I like from from childhood. I mean, it's, it's happy memories. You you don't really think too much of the record. You think of, you associate what you were doing at the time. You know, and I think it was a fairly easy childhood and. and uh, and, and all those songs sort of mean something. They're, they're all, they all seem to have an atmosphere about them. Well, those songs had a lasting quality, certainly, for you. Do you think much of today's music has a lasting quality? Oh, yeah, I think it has. I think it, it, all, all music's for, you know, hundreds of years has, you know. It's, I think it always will have. It's not all instantly disposable. There always has been instantly disposable stuff. There's always been the odd few that really stick out, and that's, that's why you have, you know, number ones, you know. Mass masses of people really like a particular record and make it number one, mm. and that that sticks out. All right, I'm going to play Vienna now as our second of three of the best, and dedicate it to Ian Sollers, who writes from Vicarage Lane, Staines, and Middlesex, who actually wrote to you, Mitch. I'm reading your letter, and he's done the history of Ultravox, a very detailed uh, synopsis and analysis of the band from beginnings to today, and he's done this project as part of his A-level communication studies. So thank you for this information. I'll pass it on to Midge, and I'll pass all the rest of your letters on to Midge. Uh, Midge will be with us for the next little while. I'll try to get through a few more questions. I'll just acknowledge Paula of Kensington, Bath, Avon, also Paul Rogers of Ainsford, Kent. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, let's see, a few more people asked for three of the best. Samantha Hughes, this is for you as well. Ultravox Vienna. Now, there's a song that clearly has lasting quality. That's Vienna. Can you still listen to that without thinking, God, I wish this was over soon? I mean, is it a song that you yourself, even though you were involved in the performance and the composition, do you, yeah, do you have a tendency, when you play it, say, to kind of want to rush through it? No, not at all. No, when we play it, there's a, it's, it's like a moment to sort of cherish when you're actually up playing it, because you, 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 there's a special atmosphere about that song that, that can be created live. Uh, even even listening to it on record, I mean, I, I don't go home and play it every night. You know, I haven't heard it since since it was in the charts, really. Um, but there's, I mean, just listen to it just now. There's still bits in there that I can sit and go, God, did they play that? You know, I mean, I, like the cello, like the, yeah. the viola parts that Billy plays. I mean, they sound they sound really nice. Uh, are you aware of anybody covering the the, the song yet? Because it's a song that I, you would think, like in years to come, you'll have cover versions of it in different styles. Well, talking about Frank Sinatra, I mean, I wanted Frank Sinatra to the cover of it. You know, I don't think he will. <laughs> really? I mean, can you imagine Frank singing that? You never know. Wonderful. Well, all you have to do is send it to him. Bill Martin, your friend Bill Martin. He'll he'll get it to to Frank Sinatra. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, let's get down to some specific questions now. Uh, when is Ultravox going to release a new single? Asks uh, a whole bunch of people. Um, Raz, Debbie, Michelle, Ashley, Vicky, Mandy, Sasha of Carl, Shelton, and Surrey. 
Well, um, as soon as we've got something that we really feel is fit for public ears, uh, there's nothing else we want to take from from Rage in Eden that we feel particularly strong about. Uh, it's, we don't we don't like the production line thing with you know another single every every two months or whatever it is. Uh, so we're having a, a bit of a gap. We seem to have been getting a bit overexposed in the last few months, so we're keeping a low profile until we've come up with something new. Okay, Fiona Wood's going to put you in the hot seat. She writes from Auckland Road, London, and she has five questions, which I'll put to you. First one is, does Midge, does Midge feel that Ultravox are now Midge your plus backing band, as he seems to have used the band as a springboard for his own ambitions? <laughs> Dear me. Well, no, not at all. I mean, Ultravox is Ultravox. That's the whole idea. Um... I mean, I'd, I'd no more think of using Ultravox for, you know, bettering my my own solo projects than uh, than trying to fly to the moon. I mean, in fact, the solo projects happened before I joined Ultravox, if if you think back. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vizai stuff, I was producing other people's records before that. And uh, I had, had a bit of a name on, on my own before joining Ultravox. No, I mean, I, I can see how uh, you might think that, but uh, I think that's more down to media. It's easier to sell... Uh, a magazine with mid years face on it than it is uh, anybody else's face because my face gets seen all the time in, in television. But simply because I'm the singer, not because I'm mid year. Okay, Fiona also wants to know if you prefer red or green apples. Uh, she's either going to throw them or give you them, I prefer. Do you? Well, if she's going to throw them, throw green ones. If you're going to give me them, give me red ones. What That's flavor it. yogurt do you like? I don't like yogurt. I don't eat, I don't drink milk. I hate it. All right, we've covered the new single. And has Midge ever met John Fox? No, I haven't. No, but um, people keep telling me I have, but I certainly haven't. I expect to have an orange box or something to stand on when I do meet him. I hear he's quite tall. <laughs> All right, Helen Mel writes from Stockwood in Bristol. And uh, out of her questions I've chosen, have Midge and Chris started filming the movie they were planning, which is set in Glasgow? This is yet one more dimension. Is this true? Are you doing a movie? Yeah, we've got uh, aspiring uh, movie directors. Um, we've, got, we've got ambitions, high ambitions. It's that thing of it's, I was saying earlier, if you want to do something, go ahead and do it. I mean, it's, it sounds so outrageous. Some idiot who's never done anything saying, right, I'm going to do a movie. Uh, but I, I feel I can do it. Uh, we're, we're still working on the script. Uh, we couldn't get the book that we wanted to base it on, um, so we're writing a script that isn't a million miles away from it. It's still happening in Glasgow, and it's based in the 1920s, the Glasgow Gangs. And uh, we will do eventually, but uh, it just takes a long, long time when you're actually getting it all together yourself. Sounds tremendous. There was some, some good... Well, the two main movies, of course, out of Glasgow recently are Gregory's Girl, and the one that I really, really liked, which was when I first came back from Atlanta, Georgia, to uh, this country, the first thing I turned on the television and saw in its entirety was this movie called That Sinking Feeling. It was the same guy. It was the same director. Yeah, And it was the same boy and, and, uh, as was in Gregory's Girl. Same cast. What's interesting is that Gregory's Girl in America has subtitles. Of course, yeah. Well, you know, if everybody sort of spoke like that, Jim, you know, you wouldn't know what you're saying, you know. <laughs> it's... it's you know, but I mean, I can I can understand everything they're saying um, really clearly because they do speak quite slow, and it's for a for a, a an English or American speaking audience, not really for a Scottish audience. But uh, having subtitles, I mean, they wanted to put subtitles in uh, *Brideshead Revisited*. I mean, mm. my God, America! <laughs> exactly. No, uh, but that sinking feeling, what a marvellous, I can't enthuse m enough about that. It's, it's, it's such, such a ridiculous idea, it was fabulous. It was about these guys, if you didn't see the film, this, this gang of uh, lads who decided that um, we, they were on the dole and they wanted to, to make some money. They, they found out that I think stainless steel sinks fetched some money or something, <laughs> raiding this warehouse of stainless steel sinks. And the actual, uh, how they planned it and what have you, is very, very fun. If you ever get the chance to see it, I, I promise you'll enjoy it. Right, Bananarama with the Fun Boy 3 next. And the reason I'm playing Really Saying Something is that for those of you that have seen the video on Top of the Pops for this song, you may well be interested in it. You may already know that Midge produced that. Now, mm. how did that happen? Where did you get the ideas for that? Uh, w well, Chris, Chris and I have done a few things. Right? We, we did uh, Yellow Pearl for Phil Leonard, and uh, we did a couple of his eyes things. And near the end of the, the I mean, the last Ultravox things, uh, we were taking almost total control in the, in the direction of the videos as well. Um, the banana banana rama thing just came along our way and asked if we, we were interested. We thought it was great because we thought the girls looked fabulous, you know. Just thought it would be a, a bit of a, a laugh doing it. And we just put all, all the ideas together, wanted it something really light and bubbly and fun, all sort of pink and blue and, and you know, people nipping or bumming things. It was just great, you know. So uh, we just went, went to town and uh, lived our fantasies.